My name is Alicia Middleman. I'm a curator here at the Estes Park Museum. This oral history project is a partnership between the Estes Valley Library and the Estes Park Museum. I moved to Estes Park in 2009 and began rock climbing that same year. Today is November 7th, 2012. This interview is taking place at the Estes Park Museum. What is your full name? Stephen Leonard Comito. When and where were you born, Steve? Fort Wayne, Indiana, March 29th, 1941. Okay. When did you begin rock climbing? I started mountaineering in 1958. Where were some of your first adventures? In the Tetons of Wyoming. Uh, at that date, I came to Wyoming with a group of boys from my hometown on a YMCA-sponsored trip. We went through a day of climbing instruction with the Exum School, and then a few days later we climbed the Grand Teton by the Owen Spaulding route, and that was the beginning of my intense interest in mountains and mountaineering. What did your family think of your adventures? Uh, they thought it was rather uh, stupid. And they had a nickname for you? Uh, Meshuga, which in Yiddish means crazy. They thought spending time in the mountains, mountaineering, was uh, a something smart... That, something that they wouldn't care to do and uh, could see no valid reason for it. Were there any friends in your hometown interested in, in mountaineering? A few of the boys who had been with me on the YMCA trip later accompanied me back to the Tetons uh, on our own uh, for a repeat of the first trip. And when did you come out to Colorado? In the uh, fall of 1960 to be a student at the University of Colorado in Boulder. What were you studying there? Uh, engineering. And did you have uh, trips into the to the foothills? Near That's why campus? I came here. And I understand technical climbing on the flat irons was popular at the time. Did you participate in climbing there? Sure, the flat irons and El Dorado Canyon and Boulder Canyon, and then occasional trips up here to the real mountains. What was your impression of? of the Rocky Mountains at that time? Uh, I was just astonished. Uh, and I felt that uh, I had finally come home to a place that I had been homesick for for most of my life. When did you move to Estes Park and what attracted you to the area? I had wanted to move here for a number of years. I had been living in Boulder for most of a decade. I had started my business in Boulder after I left school. And Estes Park at that time was just a place that we would come through on our way to mountain adventures. And as I got older and acquired a family, I began to think, I think I'd rather live in a small town than in Boulder, which by that time had grown quite large. And uh, at that time, uh, the possibility of buying a home in Boulder was pretty much out of reach where uh, remote Estes Park uh, I felt had a little more reasonable real estate. So after a t bit of looking around, we did find a place. I am still in it after 41 years. Please describe your first business. Well, my first business is the same one that I'm in. I was repairing mountain footwear. That would be both mountain boots, hiking boots, and rock climbing shoes. Uh, that was in Boulder. And then at that same time, I began to buy footwear of that nature and to start to sell it in my shop. I had to begin that very slowly because that's pretty capital intensive and I was pretty capital short. But uh, as the business slowly grew, first in Boulder, then in Estes Park, uh, the retail end of it became much more important, a much larger portion of the revenue. And that really continued up until about the mid-1980s. Uh, at that time, a number of 
much larger businesses had begun competing in the mountain footwear business. And after a while, I realized I simply could not compete with them on the retail end. So I pretty much eliminated uh, boot sales and concentrated just on the repair business, which was still a place that I could compete in. So the only retail business I do now is primarily footwear accessories and uh, guidebooks and maps. Was there anyone else in Estes Park providing this service at the time you began your business here? Well, that would depend how you find the service. In the 41 years that I have lived here, there have been three general shoe repair shops that have come and gone. And by specializing just in mountain footwear and concentrating especially on the mail order end of that business, I am happy to say that after more than four decades, I'm still here. There were retailers from time to time, and there still are, who are selling out what we call outdoor equipment. And uh, there, several of those are here still. And uh, the whole Outdoor industry has grown so great that 40 years ago I could never have anticipated that it would be a, as large an industry as it is. And my decision to just specialize on a small portion of that industry rather than trying to compete with so many other retailers, I, I feel has still proven to be a, a, a wise decision. Where was your shop? Huh. My first shop was located in the basement of my home, and that was up on Davis Hill. And even though I was vaguely aware that that region was not zoned for business, I figured if I don't bother anybody, uh, probably they won't bother me. But that was very naive. I was much younger then. And the neighbors started to notice that there were a lot of long-haired uh, types coming and going from my house, sometimes trying out brand new boots. So they filed a complaint with the town. Uh, the building inspector uh, came around and saw what I was doing and said, you know, this isn't zoned for retail business. Uh, so you're going to have to move. Uh, I was so fond of the location of being right underneath my home and my family that I actually hired an attorney to see if we couldn't get a variance. And uh, that was hopeless. <laughs> so in the spring of 1972, I had to go about looking for a legitimate retail location. The first one that I found was at Beaver Point, which is on the western edge of Estes Park. Uh, nowadays, it's directly across from National Park Village South. I was there for two years, and then at the end of that time, the county, which was occupying a large building closer to town, which had formerly been the National Park headquarters, the county offices moved out to a different location, and that building became available. Uh, so I was able to get a lease on that building. Uh, it was quite a bit larger than I really needed, but fortunately at the same time, one of my close companions uh, got the concession for mountain climbing guiding in Rocky Mountain Park. So he took the upstairs for his office, and I took the downstairs for my business, and between the two of us we could just barely make the overhead. Later on, uh, another acquaintance moved into the upstairs and started a soft goods company. He was making uh, gators and packs. It was called banana equipment. And uh, so that operation worked pretty good for about 12 years. Who owned the guide service upstairs? His name was Michael Covington. Uh, he got the concession from the park uh, after the existing concessionaire, who was a Swiss guide, uh, just released it. He didn't want to renew it. and. Uh, Rocky Mountain Park still allows only one mountain climbing concession. Uh, and at that time, uh, it attracted quite a bit of business, both in 
mountain instruction, climbing instruction, and in guided trips. Uh, he later sold that business uh, right about the 1980. It was purchased by Mike and Peggy Donahue, who ran it into the late 90s, and then they sold it, and uh, the current owners have it now. And your friend selling the soft goods, what was well, his or her Well, he moved out because he needed more room, and then eventually his business went bankrupt. <laughs> but uh, among the three of us, we were able to keep the thing going for quite a while. Twelve years, it was a good twelve years. And just to be clear, what year did you begin your business on Davis Hill? That was in 1971 when I mo moved to Estes Park. We had been living in a trailer in a trailer park in Boulder, and after we found this very reasonable house, which in those days uh, sold for less than a, a compact car does nowadays, uh, and I thought, well, this will be a very economical way to run my business. Unfortunately, it wasn't legally zoned. What was it like in the earliest years that you owned your business? Particularly after I moved into the, the old park headquarters building, and uh, I was just surrounded by lots of young people with similar interests to mine. And it almost made me think that Maybe I was Peter Pan and this was the land of lost boys and a few lost girls. Uh, it, it was just a, a very, it was a, it was a very stimulating time for me. Estes Park in those days was, as I had said, just a place to drive through on the way to the mountains. And the, the thought of actually being able to live here year round uh, seemed just an, an impossible dream and yet we were able to make that happen, and I was very pleased at that time. Uh, it did work. None of us were earning a huge income, but it was enough to keep us there. And for most of them who were young and single, it was enough. Did you host friends in the store? Well, even nowadays, uh, more than 30 years later, I am occasionally accosted by someone who says, Oh, I remember sleeping in your shop for about three weeks in the summer of 1978 or something like that. Yeah, it, it was a little island of uh, outcasts in the middle of this uh, town. And for years, uh, I felt as if uh, we were sort of establishing a colony in the midst of hostile natives. But you know, we, we did survive for quite a while. How was it for you to operate your business and have the shop teeming with activity? Uh, I thought it was great. Uh, most of these people were either friends or close acquaintances, or they soon became that way. And uh, it may have seemed a little strange, uh, particularly to some of the neighbors, that is a residential neighborhood, uh, to see young people coming and going at all hours. Uh, especially during the summer, uh, there would be young people maybe coming up from some of the valley towns uh, like Boulder or Denver who would actually bivouac in the parking lot since it was forbidden to do that in the national park so that they could get up early to go in uh, and do climbs in the national park. <laughs> there were uh, occasional controversies regarding that, but uh, fortunately it, uh, it never came down to uh, a, a, big, uh, a big problem. Was the atmosphere competitive? Uh, you mean with regard to the climbing? Yes. Uh, most young climbers are fairly competitive, but uh, there's also uh, a sense of mutual assistance. Uh, climbers will tell each other about a particular route that they have done or that they would like to do. So, uh, yeah, it's a, sort of a, a band of brothers and sisters. Remember now, that was the 70s, and uh, lifestyles were changing quite a bit then. And uh, young people, instead of 
finishing school and going immediately into a job career, uh, many were just sort of hanging out. And because climbing can involve areas of interest all over the globe, uh, a lot of them had become a world travelers. And uh, yeah, that just added to the sense of companionship, yeah. Often there would be people sleeping at the shop when I'd come in early in the morning that I didn't know, but <laughs> for the most part, uh, that didn't cause too much of a problem. Uh, in an article you contributed to in 1998, you explained that you and your friends created a community of, of um, climbers in the midst of a tourist town. Tell me more about how you cohabitated your colony with uh, a busy summer town. Uh, as I say, at times it did seem as if uh, we were aliens. <laughs> uh, fortunately, that location was remote enough that we didn't have too many visitors uh, who weren't really interested in what we had to offer. Uh, as the guide service became uh, much larger, uh, there would be lots of clients uh, coming through to take climbing lessons or to be guided for climbs in the park, and often they became my customers. But as far as the, the general run of visitors, we really didn't encounter them other than the normal activities of the day, uh, going out for groceries or laundry or whatever it was we were doing. As I say, it, w it was sort of an isolated colony. Uh, in my present shop, which I had to move to in 1986, uh, then I'm much more in what you might call the mainstream. And so I have many encounters during the day trying to explain that no, we don't sell Western boots. Uh, no, we don't fix purses. Uh, yes, I can tell you where the liquor store is. And occasionally, yes, I can tell you where there are some excellent hikes and climbs in the park. Uh, back at the old shop, we used to joke that we considered ourselves to be the fun city ranger station because, <laughs> because we were a source of information for many park visitors. And tell us where your present location is. and it's, it's three doors left of the post office. I moved there in 1986 when, as I told you earlier, my retail business was really uh, it was beginning to decrease rapidly uh, due to the pressure of many more competitors, particularly large retailers like REI. Uh, so I just, I couldn't m maintain all that space. I didn't need it anymore. Uh, so this little location that I'm in now became available and grudgingly I moved there. The guide service, uh, after a few years, took over the building and actually even bought the building, and uh, it's still there. How did de demand evolve over the years? And how did you adapt to new styles of footwear, including EB boots to sticky rubber? Well, it's always hard to foresee the future. And back when I started, most climbers were using very heavy mountaineering boots, even for hiking. And then what was called in those days, Kletterschuh, which is a German term meaning climbing shoe, which more resembled a chukka boot. Uh, and that was what we were working on. And as time evolved, uh, the technology slowly became much, much, much more advanced. Uh, it didn't require that much of an adaptation because it was still boot repair. Uh, boots, of course, now are much lighter and climbing shoes are tiny by comparison. Uh, I guess the main change has been in the heavier hiking and mountaineering boots 
Most nowadays do not have what we call a stitched on sole. Adhesive takes almost all of the load for attaching a boot upper to a boot sole. And that required a little bit of adaptation, but it's not rocket science. In your own career of mountaineering, did you maintain using some of the more traditional footwear, or did you um, adapt to the, to the more recent styles? Sure. Uh, there were great advantages uh, to the more modern footwear, particularly in the mid-80s, 1980s, when high friction rubber became available, and that really changed the industry. And uh, of course I started to use it myself, and then once we had high friction rubber available to us, uh, that really increased the rock climbing shoe business. And uh, that portion of our repair business, that is rock climbing shoes, is about one half to two thirds of our volume. The other is in the hiking boots and mountaineering boots and traditional cross country ski boots. Do other big equipment advancements come to mind? Oh, yeah, the industry has really exploded. Back when I started climbing, uh, climbers protected themselves uh, with temporary attachments to the rock, which were called pitons. And uh, that, those were driven into the cracks in the rock uh, with a hammer, and usually, if they could be, removed with a hammer. And the big breakthrough in those came in the early 1970s uh, with the adaptation of chalk stones, artificial chalk stones, usually made of aluminum, uh, that could be wedged in the cracks and, first of all, weren't so heavy, secondly, didn't require a heavy hammer, and third of all, were less damaging to the rock. And then in the late 70s, uh, the spring-loaded cams uh, were developed, and that's made a huge change. Also, when I began climbing, most climbers just tied in either directly to the rope around their waist or with a wrap of one-inch webbing around the middle. Those were called swami belts. And because I was climbing with uh, much more advanced, much more skillful climbers than myself, occasionally I had to ask for tension from the rope, and I found that the ties around my waist uh, were very uncomfortable. In fact, it could even make breathing difficult. So I fabricated uh, on my own what later has become to be known as climbing harnesses. And the climbing harnesses have made a big difference, and they're pretty standard now. But when I first started using them, I was teased by the fact that it looked like an athletic supporter. Well, in a way it was, but not in the traditional sense. Uh, so sure, in, in climbing, and of course in the, in the clothing, it's just exploded with waterproof, breathable gear. That was always a big problem. If you had something that was waterproof, it made you sweat. If you had something that didn't make you sweat, it soaked through. Uh, lightweight insulations. Uh, so the outdoor industry has, has just expanded almost exponentially. Back in the old days, I would occasionally go to trade shows in order to see what was new on the market. But in those days, the trade show, uh, which was usually a once or twice a year event, was dominated by the downhill ski industry. And they only grudgingly allowed other types of outdoor equipment to be shown. <laughs> and now the outdoor ski industry uh, is in a period of either stagnant growth or decline, and the other parts of the outdoor industry have just exploded. And uh, usually at least once a year, I'll go to this huge outdoor retailer show in Salt Lake City. And it's just like Alice in Wonderland. It's, it's unbelievable how much equipment is there, how many retailers come to do business, and how important that show is for the city of Salt Lake City. Uh, apparently, it's the largest single convention that they have there. Uh, there's even rumors about it possibly being moved to Denver. And of course, there's always competition for that type of business because it generates a lot of income, even if just for a short period of time. 
you know, the outdoor industry has exploded. At one time, I think we felt that we were sort of apart from the rest of humanity, and now a whole lot of humanity has just overwhelmed us, uh, particularly with regard to indoor climbing gyms. Uh, Forty years ago, if you'd have said there would be a large number of climbers who never left the indoors, uh, I would have said, oh, come on. But obviously, climbing gyms are being built all over the country now. And uh, I say, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Steve, you mentioned making your own harness. Were others, were your friends building their own equipment, designing their own things to suit their needs in the mountains? Well, climbers often are fairly innovative, but as far as the harness, this was back in the early 60s. Uh, I don't think anybody else at that time that I was climbing with had a harness. They just tied in with a swami belt, the webbing around the waist. And I was only able to do that because at that time, I was working for a company called Jerry Mountain Sports, and they had heavy-duty sewing machines for making packs. Uh, and so uh, during my off hours, I would just get some webbing and, and make it up on their sewing machines. Yeah. And these were friends in Boulder? Most of my friends were in Boulder, although, once again, uh, climbers can be quite itinerant. Uh, in those days, there were a number of climbers from Laramie who would come down to Boulder. Uh, just because of the accessible climbing and also because there were two outdoor shops there, Jerry's and Hollybar's, where they could buy equipment. Back in that distant time, there wasn't any climbing shop in the Laramie. You were involved in some route development here. What was the attraction to the routes you chose to establish? Uh, the attraction was I was being uh, I was being press ganged into it uh, in those days, and really I haven't done that many new climbs here. Uh, but at that time, I was climbing with Leighton Core, who in the early 60s was certainly a leading climber in Colorado. And because there were so few climbers, uh, he really didn't have a large population to choose from. So occasionally I would get chosen and I would go and simply follow Leighton on these climbs. He always led when I was climbing with him. And so uh, really I haven't done that many first ascents, uh, but those are ones that sometimes have gotten published. Do you remember that day you climbed a route called Mr. President? Yes, I do. And that name may seem a, a, a little strange now, but it was at a very emotional time. That was in <clears throat> November of 1963, and we did that climb the weekend after John Kennedy had been assassinated. And of the many grief periods I've had in my life, that one still stands out uh, as being a time when I just felt decimated by the loss of that president. And I think it, you would find that maybe a lot of my co contemporaries felt the same way. And when Leighton and I did that route and he said, what should we call it? I said, well, because of the events of this past week, let's just call it Mr. President. How did you come up with the names of some of the other routes? Uh, Leighton? You. Uh, there were know. outer space. That was Leighton's idea. And that was just at the beginning of the manned space program. And uh, I guess because of its, of its uh, remote nature, uh, not that it was far away, but it, just because of being high up on the Bastille seemed like a sort of remote place, uh, that seemed like an appropriate name. I think uh, the first American astronauts had just gone into space, so he called it outer space. And the Bastille, Bastille is in El Dorado. El Dorado Canyon, yes. And it, it itself is not very remote. The, the road goes within just a few feet of the start of the climb, but uh, it was a very direct route. <laughs> and uh, it, it appealed to Leighton. And I, whenever Leighton picked a, a name, uh, that was the name that, that stuck to it. Uh, he was actually somewhat imaginative in his choice of names. 
There is a wall at the very entrance of El Dorado Canyon, and uh, it's composed of crumbly red sandstone. Well, Leighton had been reading some publications from Europe. Those were far more available at, in those days than anything from the United States. And uh, at that time, there, were, uh, there was a climb in the Alps uh, called the Rotwand, the Red Wall. And Leighton, since he didn't speak German, thought that that probably meant the Rot Wall. So there's a climb in El Dorado Canyon called the, the Rotwand uh, for Rotten Wall, uh, named after this Red Wall in the Alps. And then one of the more famous tr classic climbs in El Dorado uh, was named after one of the great buttresses in uh, the Chamonix Mont Blanc area. And that is called Le Grand Jaras. And Leighton looked at this and uh, it had sort of the appearance of a long necked animal, so he called it the Grand Giraffe. <laughs> but in those days, and that seems so, so strange now when there are so many American publications that most of the publications we had available to us originated in Europe. Some of them were translated into English uh, or they were from the British Isles and some of them <clears throat> just came over in the original language. So uh, in those days, we got a lot of inspiration from these stories of famous Alpine climbers. And uh, so in 1963, when I finally had a full-time job and could afford it, I was able to get a leave of absence and go over to the Alps. Originally, I had planned to go over with Leighton, but he would got involved in a new route in Yosemite and uh, said that uh, he, he wasn't going to go. So I went over by myself and wandered around the Eastern Alps. And uh, that was a, a transforming adventure for me, all by myself. And uh, part of that that still uh, has resonance for now is that I would visit these lovely little alpine villages and I just thought, what a great place to live your life. And when I came back to Colorado, at that time I was still living in Boulder, I looked on Estes Park and it seemed to be about as close as I was going to come to uh, an alpine village. And that's why I worked to start a business that could be conducted principally through the mail if necessary, so that I could be in a town that didn't have a, a lot of year-round uh, business, but could still function uh, through the mail. And that seems to have worked out. About two-thirds of the, my repair business comes from customers who have never been in my shop. They just simply send their, their footwear to me. And I'm, I'm proud of that. How did your, your name get out there for customers? Well, there isn't a whole lot of competition, or at least there wasn't in those days. One of the great breakthroughs I had was from my friendship with Yvonne Chenard, who had his own equipment, Chenard equipment in those days. And he began importing a rock climbing shoe from France. And uh, since I saw that that was going to become uh, a pretty significant footwear, I contacted the manufacturer and got the original soles so that I could resole them when they wore out. And those were called the Royal Robins uh, Yosemite, or they were referred to as the Blue Meanies because that was the color of the leather. And uh, that was a very popular rock climbing shoe in the early to mid 60s. Nowadays, it's heavier than most mountaineering boots. Uh, it's just amazing that people were able to climb in those. But Chenard, uh, since he was selling the boot through his catalog, put at the end of that, uh, of that page that uh, those boots, those rock shoes, could be resold, and then he gave my name and address. And so that was really my first exposure to the greater world. Of course, I'd been repairing footwear for climbers in the Boulder, Denver, Front Range area. Who are some of your heroes? I actually don't like to use the word hero simply because I think it's so overused in our society and 
this week's hero is next week's villain. Maybe a, a better current term is role model. Chenard was certainly a role model for me. In those days, it seemed like all of the outdoor businesses were owned by the generation of our parents. And then here was Chenard, who was only a few years older than myself, who was able to run a business, and it seemed like it was going to be successful. You probably know that later on, uh, he uh, sold the climbing, technical climbing business and started Patagonia. And of course, that's been a very significant source in the outdoor industry. So the idea that somebody of my own generation could actually start a business in the outdoor industry and make a living from it, that was a big, that was a, a big inspiration for me to try to do the same. And then uh, when I went to that Exum Climbing School, this was in 1958, I was just in my last year of high school, and I got to see real climbers for the first time. And two very famous climbers uh, who, who later went on to become quite accomplished. One was Barry Corbett and one was Jake Breitenbach. And so different from the athletes that I had been exposed to earlier who uh, were sort of crude in, in expression. And these guys were well-spoken and they just had an aura about them that made me think, I'd sure like to do that someday. And then another, uh, and of course, I tried to follow in their footsteps as best I could. Jake Breitenbach, unfortunately, was killed in the 1963 Everest expedition uh, in the Kumbu Icefall. And then Barry Corbett, a few years after that, was became uh, injured, became a paraplegic uh, from a helicopter crash. But... Uh, I still remember encountering those fellows for the first time and how inspirational that was for me. And that's one of the reasons I really wanted to pursue the business of mountaineering. Of course, I came from the Midwest at that time and uh, mountaineering was, was not widely available. And so that's one of the reasons I finally, after a great deal of effort, was able to convince my parents that I really needed to go to school at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Uh, I could have studied engineering at any number of different places, but I knew that the Rocky Mountains were here. Uh, returning to some stories about the routes you were involved with, uh, Laheim, Ajax, um, prior to when, when guidebooks were as plentiful as they are today, how did people come to a consensus concerning the difficulty of a route? Uh, uh, that was a matter of controversy then, and even now it's a matter of controversy, because, uh, but less so because of the large number of climbers who do these routes, and there generally evolves a consensus. But back in those days, there was quite a bit of, uh, of controversy about, oh, it wasn't that hard. Yes, it was. Yeah. But once it's printed in a guidebook, then it tends to become more authoritative. What was the conversation like following your first ascent of the sandstone tower in the Moab area? Uh, the conversation. The, that was once again uh, an area of very little traffic. Uh, very few climbers had gone into those sandstone towers. And all of the time I was there, uh, of course, Leighton was pretty much running the show uh, on most of those climbs. And I began to think, I wonder if we really shouldn't be here. It was so different from the solid rock climbing uh, here or in Boulder that I was used to that I thought, maybe we're all just going to die. But. Uh, it was, it was a new area of exploration, and of course now the desert towers are commonly climbed. And that's sort of the, the evolution of climbing or the evolution of human activity. Once it's been done, then it opens the way for 
others to follow. You mentioned the word ex exploration. Was that a big component in your motivation for mountaineering? Sort of. I've always been a bit timid, and exploration often refers to going to where <laughs> hardly anyone has gone before. And uh, I often have tended to assume that if the outcome wasn't fairly certain, that it might be bad. So, yeah, in those days, a lot of climbing involved a certain amount of exploration. And certainly there are those who are much more motivated to explore than I am. I sort of went along as a, a fellow traveler. Uh, but I was dependent on climbers who were much more skilled and adventurous than myself. So I'm glad to see all of the guidebooks come out because I think of the early years and how much time I and my companions would spend blundering around in areas that turned out to be dead ends. And uh, I thought, boy, I wish we knew the way to go. But eventually more and more guidebooks came out. In the early days, a lot of that was just, it was oral history. And of course, oral history can become inaccurate. Do you remember someone saying something to you that had a big impact on your approach to climbing or how you live your life? Uh, I may have to think about that. <laughs> Leighton, uh, who, who was a very considerable influence on me in the early days would make statements like, uh, oh, don't be so afraid. The worst thing that can happen is we'll just fall off and get killed. <laughs> uh, oh, I wish I had had time to think about that. I guess probably the best answer I can come up with on short notice is... Uh, is the idea that we only get to go through this once. And when we come to the end of it and to say, oh, I wish I had done something else would be a great tragedy. So I have sort of conducted my life with the idea that uh, I don't want to feel regret for how I've lived my life. Part of the reason that I have started and run my own business is because I found it very disturbing to be under the influence of a single individual, as so often happens when one is working uh, for an organization. and. I figured if uh, I was going to be dependent for my income on my way of life uh, on somebody else, it had better be me. Are there any last stories you'd like to share? Now that I've gotten to a, a stage of life where I am less motivated to be pushing the envelope, as they say. Uh, I think the contribution that I would like to make is uh, first to be of use to those who are looking for mountain adventures. Uh, in my retail business, I'm often and I often encounter. Uh, visitors, climbers, skiers, who are saying, where's the good place to go? And having spent a lot of time in this area, uh, I feel like I'm able to give them good advice depending on what type of outing they would like, uh, what the current conditions are like. 
And the other is, now that I have three grandsons, if I can pass along to them the, the benefits that I've derived from my years of mountain activities, hiking, climbing, cross-country skiing, uh, that would make me very happy. I've done what I can. Uh, my two older grandsons live in a place where even though it's within a few hours drive of the Canadian Rockies, uh, they don't have much chance to visit it because they're very involved in the typical sporting activities of, of our society, uh, basketball and football. So uh, whenever I'm with them, particularly when they come here, uh, I would like to pass along to them uh, the affection that I have for mountain sports, something out of the conventional playing fields, or as I like to say, to go to the unlevel playing fields. Thank you. Thank you.